Um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just want to first recognize Angela. Um, I don't know where she went, but this is such an extraordinary event that you've put together, and I just want to give you another round of applause for all that you've done for us. And welcome to both of you. Nice to see you this morning. Thank you so much um, to everyone for coming out. Um, uh, Angela is a, a colleague of mine at Uber, and I think that it's such a, she's such a great example of um, someone who not only has done incredible things for our company and the community there, but um, for the world and outside of the company, and it's really extraordinary. Um, so, and thank you everyone for showing up uh, on time this morning for this panel. Um, it is, the, the title of the panel is um, Winning the Pitch and Growing Your Business, and I definitely want to get into that, but I know that the audience is also um, interested to hear about each of your uh, professional journeys and your, and your paths um, to where you are. And so, Stacey, I want to start start with you and sort of um, your background. There was a recent, um, I guess it was last year, wonderful New York Times profile on you, the title of which was Being a Black Woman in Silicon Valley. And um, what I found interesting is that you you said that you wanted to be an accountant, right? You didn't set out to, to be a CEO in your life. Um, and it was a partner at your accounting firm who happened to be black. And that really um, showed you that possibility, right? And so I, I'm, I want to know about sort of that journey and what um, representation meant for you and how that was important and how you view yourself now as someone who is um, representing. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to say thank you for having me. This is so nice to just be around black people. <laughs> um, and uh, I have my TaskRabbit team represented here. I think there's some folks from HP, and so appreciate the support. Um, you know, my career has always been about figuring out how to make the world better or the environment that I'm in better than I left it. And I grew up in Detroit in the west side in the city and there was a lot of things that weren't great about the neighborhood, but there was a lot of things that were. There was a community, we looked out for each other, people took care for, of each other. And while we didn't have a lot, my mother always focused on education and I knew no one could take that away from me. Mm -hmm. So I always sought out to just be my best self and that things would just sort of happen to me. And Derek, who was the partner at PwC when I was there, he was one of the only black partners at the time and so to aspire to be anything, you have to be see what is possible. And so he allowed me to see that I could pursue a career that was something that I wanted for myself. I chose not to become a partner in a public accounting firm and chose to then go to business school at Stanford, and that's what brought me to the Bay Area. I spent almost 10 years at Google and before going to TaskRabbit, where I started as a COO and then became the CEO about three years ago. And all of that was really about my process of finding a mission that I really cared about, pursuing it with all that I had, and then leveraging and leaning on the mentors that came along. John was one of those people. I don't I know if get he to would that. call I myself get to a that. mentor, but we can talk about that story uh, when we get to it. And, you know, you don't you can't see yourself as a CEO when there aren't other black women who are CEOs. In 2009, I went to India to run the Google office in Hyderabad, and um, that was right before, right after Ursula Burns became the CEO of Xerox. So I land, and everybody sort of knew who I was, this woman coming from corporate to like run our team. That's basically who I was, it was Stacy, and she seems amazing. And this woman walks up to me, she probably was fresh out of college, maybe her first job ever, two years you know, into working. And she was, are you, are you like Ursula? <laughs> right, and that was like the mental model. So you, you needed a mental model, and me for myself, I needed something that I could aspire to and believe. And now I try to give that gift back to other people. When Aisha was named CEO of Zoo, mm -hmm. Zoots, I like emailed her immediately and said, congratulations, like we need more people like us taking these roles in, in technology. I love that, um, especially in that you had, you know, this model of this um, black partner, and that was what you aspired to be. And then you, you know, as you sort of continued along your journey, you thought, well, actually, I want to be a CEO, and I'm going to go um, figure out how to do that. But that you had Ursula as an example, right? I mean, we still have such a long way to go, but um, we talk a lot about first, and to have her, um, a, a black woman, um, to to look at as a, a model for that, I think, is extraordinary. Um, John, I think you have such a very interesting and varied path as well. Um, and um, 
one thing that really stuck out to me, I actually interviewed Ursula recently as well, and she um, spent 38 years at Xerox, and you spent 28 years at IBM. Actually, and actually 27 years, nine months, and 13 days. Not, no, who's counting? But yes, exactly. <laughs> So you were there for you know over two decades, right? And when I talk to um, you know my peers and, and generations um, you know behind me, I think it's fair to say that a lot of us don't imagine you know that we will stay at a company at one company um, for over 20 years. And I would love for you to just talk about that. And you know, as somebody who has done it and has achieved so much success in doing that, and what your experience was, and how you might talk to someone like me or us who might not imagine that being our path. Well, I joined IBM in 1971, long before many of you were born. Um, and I joined in large part because the guy who was running outplacement services at Florida a and a historically black college, um, said to me, IBM's gonna be on campus looking for salespeople. I'd been selling stereo equipment for the last two years I was in college. And he says, you should go and interview. I said, now look at me, I've got an 800 pound afro, a big beard, two-tone shoes, you know, I, I don't look like an IBM. I don't even own a white shirt. So he says, I don't care, go. And so sure enough, I went, and the guy who was literally interviewing me <clears throat> was a sales manager for IBM looking to buy a stereo system, and I was in the stereo business. <laughs> so I spent much of that interview trying to convince him that he should buy not just the products that we had in our store, but from me. Right. <laughs> and the end result was they offered me a job, and I'm like, I don't really know. So I thought, okay, the, back in those days, the most important careers in the African American community were a teacher, a preacher, a doctor, and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. The fifth one was, quote, a business person. And that implied something in the local community as opposed to something more broad. So I thought, okay, this is one, not one of the four. It's sort of in category number five. So maybe I ought to do that and I'll do it for two years, and then I'm gonna become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, 18 months in, I go to my father-in-law, who was the first African-American judge in Palm Beach County, and I said to Ed, gee, Ed, I'm thinking about going back to law school. And so he says, okay, let's talk about that. Um, how much money do you make now? I said, oh, about $11,000 a year. And he says, in two years, how much money will you make? Well, I was an optimist, it'd be twice that. He says, and in four years, how much? I said, well, by then I'll be running the place, <laughs> which was kind of a joke. But he, he, he said, well, look, if you think you're going to double your salary in the next couple of years in light of the fact that you're in sales, and if you think that the progress for your career can continue, then maybe you ought to pursue that as opposed to pursuing a law degree, which was great counsel for me at that moment in time. So I decided to double down. And I got very, very lucky. In 1971, 72, there weren't many people of color in IBM or in tech. And so my first mentor was a white guy. As a matter of fact, when I had a horrible experience where I'd gone on a sales call with a local rep and I was told by the client, don't ever come back here again. And IBM's position back in those days was if you don't want to do business with the rep who we've assigned to your account, we don't want to do business with you. So I ended up having my first aha moment when I said to my manager, look, I'm not the sales rep. Bob is the sales rep. So you should not take this transaction away from Bob. But it really does put me in an awkward position vis-a-vis -vis selling new accounts mm -hmm. to biased companies in the Tampa area. Well, my career literally accelerated five years with that one instance because I went from being a targeted new account sales rep to being an enterprise sales rep overnight. And my first mentor was a long, long time sales leader in IBM who grabbed me by the shoulder, put his arm around me and said, stick with me, kid. I'm going to have you farting through silk underwear. <laughs> and he became my first mentor in the company. And all along the way, I realize I need to have someone who is knowledgeable about the company, knowledgeable about career progress, and knowledgeable about the strengths and weaknesses that one might have as you progress your career. And I had wonderful career experiences at IBM, but woke up one day, 28 years later, and realized I'm never gonna get to run this place. 
And if I'm going to run a company, I better get on with it because I'm about to be 50 years old. And so I opted out and moved to the Valley, ran Symantec for 10 years, um, ran a little startup for six years. I was only going to run it for six weeks, but it turned about to be six years. And along the way, joined a few public company boards like Microsoft and Seagate and Illumina and a few others. And so I've had a wonderful career in large part because my father-in-law, first father-in-law said, don't go to law school. And second, my first mentor said, stick with me, kid. I'm going to teach you how to be successful. Well, as a recovering lawyer, I'm not going to be offended by <laughs> the, but I, what I think is Im important about that too, and it says something about um, corporate leadership, right, and that IBM had taken that position that if you don't, you know, do business with our sales reps and we're not doing business with you. And secondly, that you, it was your manager or whoever that said, I'm going to take you out of this situation and I'm going to actually, you know, promote you essentially, right, and put you on these big enterprise accounts, which accelerated your career. But right that was coming from the company, right? And I think about IBM um, has, at least back then, was very much known for sort of diversity and leadership. And in fact, um, my grandfather um, came out to IBM from the South, and he was one of the you know few black employees back then. And as the story goes, he brought like all his friends and family from the South to San Jose to work there, but it was known for that, right? Sure. And I'm curious, you know, as you've seen, both of you have seen so much in your careers, but often being the only person in the room that looks like you or the only person in, you know, a position of power that looks like you, um, how you've dealt with um, culture. And John, I've heard you talk sometimes about assimilation. And, um, you know, you said you didn't even own a white shirt, right? You have this afro. And um, how you've dealt with that over time and uh, if there have been points where you felt more comfortable being yourself as Ed was talking about earlier, if you felt like you had to kind of get to a certain point of power that you could then be kind of like the Beyonce moment of like, you know, I've achieved enough that I can, I can be out there in my authentic way. But how have you dealt with that? Well, I had a aha moment about four years into my IBM career where I had moved from a sales rep in Tampa to a staff job in Atlanta which meant my career was progressing okay. And I looked around the bull pit one day and realized, I don't look like anybody else here in the room. And ironically enough, it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. It had more to do with me being non-compliant in IBM stress code, because I just did not believe in blue suits and white shirts. And so I would wear a, a, what I call the two sister suits. Polly and Esther. <laughs> and they were all kinds of colors and all of that. And I'd be put up with that. And then I realized, you know, I'm putting myself at a disadvantage. Why do I care about a blue suit versus a Polly or Esther suit? So why don't I go buy a blue suit and buy a couple of white shirts and not have that be a distractor, if you will, from people saying we can't put him in a management role because he doesn't look like any other manager here. And again, it wasn't about the color of my skin. It was about me being compliant and conforming to the standards, if you will, that the company had. So once I did that, lo and behold, things just started to accelerate. Mm -hmm. Because there was no reason for them to say someone who was performing well shouldn't have an opportunity to compete for the next job. Mm -hmm. And because I had eliminated the mustache and the beard and the afro and all that other stuff, all of a sudden, I was a black guy that was conforming to the standards of IBM. Mm -hmm. And that candidly accelerated my career. Wow. Stacy, I'm curious about what you think about this. One, um, back to the, you know, staying at in one place for a long time. You were at Google for 10 years, and to be honest, I also cannot imagine being anywhere for 10 years. Um, but related to that, you know, what you have, have seen over your time, and we have all these conversations now about bringing your whole authentic self to work, and again, Ed, you know, opening with um, Be Yourself, which is so important. But we know that in spaces like tech and in other, you know, corporate industries, it, it can be hard, and um, it can it can feel stifling, right? I think when people cannot be their selves, you can't fully uh, bring all of your talents to the table. How have you thought about that? You know, I was listening to your story, and I'm reflecting on the fact that I was taught to conform. Um, when I was in banking, even at PwC, there was a uniform you know, what people wore. And by then there was like, I think at Goldman at one point there was Friday casuals and 
I'm older too than you might think. Um, but then when I got to Silicon Valley, like people showed up, like really haven't showered, maybe for religious reasons, maybe not, you know, um, didn't shave, like wore the same t-shirt often, stuff like that. And so I said, well, you know what? Like this is not that kind of place. And yet, even at Google, I still had this thing that I had to kind of fit in and conform because I know when I walk into a room, I'm different. Mm -hmm. And so I'm already going to stand out. So let's minimize the other areas where, where I could, had to stand out. And then I decided to wear my hair natural. Mm -hmm. And I remember being at Google and I had talked to Chris about it. My husband, I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. And he was like skeptical about the whole situation too, but he was like, whatever you wanna do. Um, so I you know, cut it all off and I had these little tiny twists and I was terrified to go to work the next day. I was like, people are gonna think of me differently. And I get to work and everyone's like, hey Stacy, how are you? Your hair looks cute. And then we start the meeting. And it was, it was me. It was the first time I realized that I actually can be more of who I am, whatever that might be in that moment. And most people will actually see through that. We are in a different era and in a different time where that's okay. So I, real, I started to embrace that. And now at TaskRabbit, I encourage, and one of our values is around bringing your whole self to work. And yesterday we were honored to have Congresswoman Barbara Lee come and participate in our Black History Month celebration. And she just talked very plainly about what life was like. And there was a dialogue that most people don't get to engage in with a diverse community of people. And there's something powerful in that, in being real and being authentic and being who you are. But there was that moment that, for me, the moment was me letting go of my own traditions and what people had taught me and allowing myself to fully be who I am. Did you feel though that you had to reach a certain point before you felt comfortable doing that? Because I think, you know, you now being in leadership, you're able to set the tone from the top, which is important to have folks like you in leadership, right? But what was that moment when you decided like, okay, I'm gonna do this and go I with do. it? I do, I was a director. Okay. Um, and I was, you know, I was more senior kind of technically, and I did feel like, you know what, I've been here for a few years, what have I got to lose? I know all these people. So there was some safety in the tenure and seniority that came with it. But I will say that talking to other women who have risen to levels of success, I'm sorry for not doing it sooner. So if there's anybody in this room right now who is earlier in their career and feels like they need to make director or VP or some other title to become who you fully are, like do not wait on that and do not use me as the model because that is not what the world needs and what society needs today. Okay. Yeah, to that point, when I moved to the Valley in 99 to run Symantec, the press release went out at five o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock East Coast time. And by about 10.30, 11 o'clock, the San Francisco Chronicle and all the reporters went, oh my gosh, he's black because they were shocked that all of a sudden an African-American was gonna lead a major tech company in the Valley. And so the, <laughs> so the communications team came in and said, gee, all the papers wanna to talk to you. I said, well, I'm happy to talk to them, but not about my ethnicity. And they went, what? I said, no, this is not about me being black. This, about, this is about me being qualified for the job. And, and so they went, okay, I said, so I'm willing to do one interview, just one, but make sure the reporter knows this is not about race. This ought to be more about my career experience and what my plans are for Symantec. So sure enough, reporter comes in and he says, um, Mr. Thompson goes through this long list of questions. And so when he's done, he gets up to walk out of the room and he turns his, can I ask you one final question? Couldn't help himself. Right. And so he says, what's it feel like to be the highest ranking African American in tech? And I slammed my fist down on the desk and I said, I will not be the picture poster child for African Americans in tech. That's not why I'm here. Well, guess what the headline in the paper was the next day, right? And so we all learn 
that we have to kind of moderate some of our <laughs> emotions sometimes. And that was a horrible, horrible experience for me because I had so many people come to me and says, well, why don't you want to be recognized that way? And my answer was, look, I spent 28 years at IBM. I had all these jobs. I, had the, I ran the business unit that was 45% of the company's revenues and 65% of its profits before coming to Symantec. So I'm qualified. They ought to focus there, not on, solely on my ethnicity. But that's not the way the papers did right, it. Right. Well, it's also just sort of an absurd question, like, how does it feel to be the first black? So it's like, that's been my whole life. That's, I don't know anything else, right? Yeah, right. Like, yeah. I've been black my whole life. <laughs> yeah, right? like, feels great. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, that's uh, interesting. And like you said, that, that we then became the story, right? Yeah. Uh, it was still that issue, and he just couldn't help himself by asking that question. Yeah, exactly. Um, Stacy, you uh, talked about, you know, we have a lot of probably early and mid-career folks here and sort of thinking about, um, you know, mentorship and advisors and uh, advice that we get along the way and, you know, how that may have helped you in your journey. Um, can you talk a little bit about that around, you know, people who've been mentors to you and, and how that's helped you? Yeah, when you're, um, when you're early in your career, Derek from PwC was a great mentor for me, just a black person who had achieved. He taught me just how to work and how to present myself and how to be heard in a room. Um, at Google, Sheryl Sandberg is a great mentor to me. She saw me in a finance role and said, you know what, you could do more. You could run larger teams. And when you look at the you know, spreadsheet of a headcount of a company, it's almost always the case that sales teams and operations teams uh, have bigger groups and number of people. So I went from managing 14 to 200 people and she took a chance on me. So people like that who I've known for years. But in that, right before that opportunity happened, John came to speak at, ta at, um, at Google and he did a talk at Google and afterwards I, I went and asked him a question. And I said, you know, I said, tell me about your career. How did you become the CEO of Symantec and you know, how did you decide to do that? And he said, well, you know, career is about balance. Um, sometimes you've got to run staff functions, which I was currently in finance, and then you've got to move over and you've got to run line functions, and you had a decorated career in sales, and so as you move up, consider doing that. And had we not had that conversation, and you not been the black person to tell me that I need to make this move, when I got the opportunity to move out of a staff function into a line function, it just gave me that extra push and that confidence that I could do it. So while we never talked again until last week in prepping for this, for this right. panel, you were still a mentor to me for that 10 minutes of, of Q&A. So mentors come in all times and moments in our lives, and so thank you for that. Um, I love that, and I'm going to have to share my own little story about you quickly, Stacey. Um, so we, the most important part of the story is that it ended up in us having an epic photograph with Kevin Durant, um, the most important piece of this. But we were at an event, and um, I had already sort of been a fan of yours, and I, I walked up to you and thought I'd just introduce myself. Um, I had just had a second kid, and somehow this led to me um, telling you about how stressed out I was about doing laundry <laughs> and um, sharing that TaskRabbit was so helpful and I was trying to, you know, use it to figure out uh, all of these, uh, you know, problems. And you looked at me in my eye and you said, the next time I see you, you better not be telling me about your laundry. Like, <laughs> get it together. And it was such an, you know, it was, again, it was just a passing moment and we were in this conversation, but it really impacted me. And <laughs> part of it was, you know, what are the efficiencies that you can create in your life, right, to optimize other pieces of it. But um, it was just this lesson of you never know, right, who's going to kind of give you something that's going to be that kick in the pants of, you know, figuring out some day-to-day -day thing. Or, you know, in John's case, that really sort of you've described it as setting you on the path towards um, becoming a CEO, right? Learning that you needed to sort of diversify your experiences and get out of finance and try out other things. And this was, how, you know, how many years ago? Ten years ago, right? At least, yeah. Over 10 years ago. And John, what about you? I mean, you've had, again, such a varied experience. Yeah, I've had many mentors in my life, and ironically enough, most of the early mentors didn't look anything like me. Because guess what? There weren't African Americans in high-ranking positions in IBM in my early days. And so I got lucky to the point where uh, people who were not of color we're willing to make an investment in time and energy and what have you in me to advance my career. 
Now that being said, one of the more interesting moments for me was an opportunity to move from Atlanta, kind of the black mecca, if you will, to Boston, which back in the early 80s was far from being a black mecca. As a matter of fact, it was considered one of the more segregated communities in all of the US. And so when I got offered the job to be a sales manager there, I call the highest ranking African American in IBM at the time, a guy named Gordon Gartrell, who had been the director of sales for Boston. I said, okay, Gordon, I've got a chance to go to Boston to be a sales manager, a regional sales manager. What do you think? And his answer was, don't do it. It's the worst place in the world for African Americans at this time, 1979 it was. And so I went, really? And he went, really? Well, I'd just gone through a divorce and felt like I need a change. Mm -hmm. And so I ignored Gordon's advice, moved to Boston, and lo and behold, the guy who was the head of the Northeast was determined that he was gonna demonstrate to the world that Boston and he were not racially biased. My career took off. After being sales manager for about nine months, I became his chief of staff. After that, I became branch manager. My branch was the top branch of the country that year. I then got tapped to go to MIT Sloan School. I mean, on and on and on and on. And it was all because I followed my instinct, mm -hmm. not necessarily always the advice that someone of who looks like you would give you. Mm -hmm. So you need to be balanced in your perspective about what's the right career step. Mm -hmm. Take the step that feels good but also be prepared to accept the fact that you may have made a mistake along the way too. Yeah, I think, I mean, in both of those, the lessons are, it's not necessarily about long lasting, you know, deep relationships. I think on panels like this and other contexts, people are always asking about finding a mentor and how do I get a mentor and get this sort of lifelong um, advice. And you can find this in moments, you know, um, at a Kevin Durant event or <laughs> um, at Google, just going up to somebody, you know, after the talk and really being intentional about it. And I think the other piece of it too is that you also have to trust, you know, gather that information as you go along, but trust your instincts and your gut. Bingo. And um, I think another important piece of that is sometimes, you know, mentors come in all different um, shapes, sizes, and colors. And I mean, for me as well, um, I often talk about the fact that some of my best, all of my best bosses have been white men. And um, yes, it's partly because there's not enough black women in those positions of leadership, and we certainly need more of them. But uh, really, you know, trusting sort of your instincts and also um, being open to sort of other, you know, types of folks. Um, so I definitely want to talk a little bit more about sort of what you guys are currently up to. And uh, Stacy, you know, what you're doing today um, at TaskRabbit is revolutionizing everyday work. And I love that you've talked about being inspired to, to uh, take that job um, growing up in Detroit and seeing people, you know, using their skills and what they had and that um, being taken away from a, a lot of them in terms of the changing industry. Um, so I'd love to know, you know, your decision to go there and the path of um, becoming, of going from CEO, COO to CEO of this little tiny startup, right? And then doing something really big, but uh, you know, I wanna get into that. Yeah, I, um, after nine years at Google, I, I'd been there for that long because the mission of Google to organize the world's information was so big. And I had so many amazing opportunities, but I was sitting in my office you know, corner office, all the things that everybody from Detroit had ever wished for me or themselves or their children, the community, I had it. Mm -hmm. But I was sitting there feeling like this isn't it. I had not arrived for what I was supposed to be doing right now. And so it was time for me to move on. But I could only go to something that had a very powerful mission that really got to me. And you're right, our, you know, our mission is to make everyday life easier for everyday people. And I grew up in a community where that just went plummeted because of the auto industry. And now there's this platform that is connecting people and helping people find meaning and purpose in the work that they do. And so I fell in love with that. TaskRabbit was in you know, nine cities in the US at the time. And this woman, Leah Buskey, was amazing. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna go help her build this company. And the model of, of founder COO was becoming an interesting thing. Cheryl was now COO at Facebook, right? And everyone was sort of writing about it in the tech. So I didn't want to be a CEO. I didn't want her job. I just wanted to build this great company. And so we did. We started launching more cities. We launched our second country. We began to grow the business together. 
And three and a half years in, she was ready to move on and do something else. And we mutually agreed that I would step into the CEO. We went to the board and had that conversation. But I only took the CEO job because I knew it was something else that I could do different. I'd been there three and a half years. If I was going to take the CEO job, what, is, what else am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I couldn't come up with something, then someone else should do the job. But my vision is to really bring TaskRabbit everywhere for everyone in the world. And we weren't yet in Detroit. We hadn't figured out. We'd figured out the coasts, mm -hmm. but we hadn't figured out the model for small cities, small markets, and really how to grow in those markets. So I wanted that for the company, and that's why I took the CEO job. And the transition was different. Nothing really prepares you for that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that, going from staff function to line function, definitely. Managing different teams, definitely. Getting board experience, definitely. But once you're in the job, it becomes more lonely than you ever expected. There's a lot of responsibility that you take on that people can't quite understand. And so it forced me to find a peer group of others. I'm in a group called YPO, Young Professionals Organizations, that I could surround myself with who were also sharing the same experiences that I had. But it was quite a transition of going from an operator to a visionary leader and flexing different mental muscles. Did you, in terms of you know talking about feeling more lonely at the top, so to speak, did you feel that those um, organizations were even more important to you when we talk about mentors and um, advisors at that point in your career? I mean, I know it's different, right? But how has that helped you? They're, they're, they're different. I wouldn't say more or less important. I was in a COO group too, okay, but but it, it it is more important to have a way to manage your energy, mm -hmm. and a lot of times the peer groups, and I'm sure John was in some of, you were in some of these groups. It's the energy that you need to get up every day when the things are going great and celebrate those successes, but remind people of where we're going. Those are like awesome, and then the days when things aren't going great and you know, celebrate those failures and remind people of where we're going and provide that even keeled approach so that people feel like we're gonna be all right every day. And so you do need a group of people that you can trust, rely on and talk to, to be able to be successful in that respect. Related to that, I, I'd love to know more about um, that your the exit to IKEA. And I know that it was, I mean, it was celebrated, it was well done, you, people were happy. Uh, it was the first time that you had ever done that, as far as I know. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about that, too? Yeah, that was another first. Like, it's not like, I mean, I'd done M&A at Goldman, yeah. but you were like the banker in between. Yeah. Like, if stuff didn't work out, you got paid. So, you know, that was all right. Um, and I didn't really want to, I became CEO, and I wasn't, I didn't set out to sell the company. The board wasn't like, all right, we need an exit. But one of my close friends who I consider a peer, who was also a successful CEO who had sold her company, said, well, now that TaskRabbit is successful, people are going to want to buy the company. You should come up with a list of who you're willing to sell the company to so you don't waste your time with all those other people. And I did that, and Ikea was at the top of the list, and we were in the middle of negotiating a partnership with them. And we had already had one partnership with a very large company that was not going well. And when you're small, you have limited resources. So we had a list of eight things we could work on. And people voted, my executive team, we voted four things. IKEA partnership was not on the list. And I moved it up and I said, you know what, if we don't try to make this deal work, we'll never have more opportunities with them. And I knew in my head they were on the M&A list of possibilities in the future. So we launched this partnership in December of 2016. And like the first month was not great. Mm -hmm. February was not great. People were like, see, we shouldn't have done this deal. But March was great. And then April and May, and then we started to do more stores. And then we began in the summer, the acquisition conversations, and then we sold the company in October. It was and uh, the alignment of value is the best possible thing we could have done with the company. Their mission is to create a better everyday life for the many people written 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. Ours is to make everyday life easier for everyday people written 10 years ago. And so having that alignment in values has allowed us to now be in more than 50 markets, three countries, and more to come. So we're expanding TaskRabbit at a rate that I couldn't have even imagined when I took on the CEO role. We've doubled the number of markets that we're in, we're doubled the volume in the business, and we've, we're reaching customers in a different way with the world's largest furniture retailer. Wow, 
It's amazing. Um, John, you have been CEO not once but twice, right? You were CEO of Symantec and then CEO of a smaller startup. And so you've had this experience in you know, these two contexts, one huge company and then a smaller one. And then now, uh, I think just over a year ago, you joined Lightspeed. Uh, so now you're doing VC and looking at uh, the next generation of cloud computing and technology. How have you um, drawn from those sort of different experiences as CEO um, in what you're doing now? Well, my role at Lightspeed is less about deal flow and more about helping the portfolio companies. They do about, I'd say, 50 to 60 seed round investments a year, and then another 30 or 40 Series A through whatever rounds. And so what the partner group wants me to do is advise the management teams of their portfolio companies on how to manage or navigate through this problem or that problem. I'll give you a Good example, just recently we wrote a check for about $40 million into a company called Seismic Software, which is in the CRM space and could very well prove to be very disruptive to many of the market leaders there. Well, the CEO of that company had eight term sheets, eight term sheets. And as we were looking at our ability to write a check, the question was what's gonna make a difference in them accepting our check versus BlackRock versus whoever else might have been there? And the answer was, John, would you be willing to join the board? And the answer was, sure, if they'll accept our check, I'll join the board. The flip side was there was another little company called Automation Anywhere that was looking to raise a lot of money. They raised 250 plus million dollars, but they didn't want our money, but they wanted me on the board. And my answer is, you take our check, and I'll join the board. You don't check our check, I'm off doing something else. So my view about the venture world is back in 08, when I was contemplating leaving Semantic, the thought was I'll become a venture capitalist. But I was gonna be a private investor, not a part of a venture capital firm. And so for many, many years, my wife and I wrote lots of checks to invest in silly businesses. But then I realized I didn't know what I was doing. And one of the things that I invested in was a little company called Virtual Instruments that hit a bump in the road. I did like what all board members do, which is step in and figure out what had happened, and we decided we had to move the CEO out. Mm -hmm. And once we did that, I thought, well, I'll run it for a few weeks, and then we'll find somebody. Well, six years later, um, I ended up moving on because it did not land the way we had hoped. So I've learned a great deal in my career, not just about managing businesses of scale, but managing really, really small businesses as, as well and how you have to be cash efficient and cash smart, all of the things that are relevant, if you will, today for many of the startups that I am now involved with. So to go from running an organization of my gosh, I think I had 47,000 people in my last job at IBM. I had 2,300 when I got to Symantec and we had 50 when I got to Virtual Instruments. So I think I have a perspective that is of some potential benefit to the partners and members of the Lightspeed ecosystem, if you will. I love what you said, though, about that, I mean, you're obviously a pretty smart guy. Uh, you're pretty successful, but, you know, you started doing, um, investing privately, and we're like, I don't, I don't maybe know what I'm doing, so yeah. let me go, you know, get into this other experience to help build and, and learn, right? Well, the, the issue around the startups was, I always bet on people. I don't bet on ideas. Mm. Because lots of people have great ideas, but if they're not good people, they can't execute. So it's all about who's in charge, what's the track record of the team, and then you ask, is the idea worth pursuing? Mm -hmm. And in the case of virtual instruments, I thought it was. In the case of liquid robotics, I thought it was. The challenge we had at that time was my background and experience was all in enterprise IT related infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yet I was doing a very diverse set of investments in things that I didn't know anything about. So I had to go back to my core. Mm -hmm. And so much of what I have done over the last few years prior to uh, Lightspeed was all about enterprise infrastructure related technology, which is something I know about. Mm -hmm. So the diligence process for me is a little bit easier than trying to decide do I want to do an autonomous ocean-going drone? Right. I mean, what do you know about that? Right. Right? And then you're betting on the leaders and the founders, not on your insights and ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So, I mean, Symantec is security software, right? right. And um, I, I think we have a little bit of time left, but I just want to close on sort of um, where we currently are with all of these rapid advancements in, in technology. You've seen lots of changes. What is sort of the most um, pressing uh, thing for you, maybe the biggest opportunity? Um, is it is, there, is it what Stacy's doing with the future of work? Is it Russia? Um, how do you view sort of our landscape right now? Well, I think the most significant issue that the tech community faces right now is all about privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that we can't address that issue ourselves, then it'll end up being state by state, country by country, and it'll end up being a very, very, very impactful issue for the industry overall. And so I think we as an industry need to come together, but quite frankly, the U.S. needs to come together. We don't need 50 states to declare that they're going to have their own privacy policy. That would be horrifically po problematic for all of the industry's leaders, if you will. And to be clear, it, it is. And I say this as a <laughs> former cybersecurity lawyer that, I mean, it is. It's a complete, you know, patchwork of laws and regulations. And um, it makes law firms a lot of money, but uh, it's not good for companies. It's certainly not good for consumers. Stacy, uh, what about you? What are you thinking? I mean, I know this is your work as well, but is there anything outside of what you're doing at TaskRabbit that you view as sort of a big opportunity or pressing, you know, problem? Yeah, I think what's pressing, and it, it's, it's related to TaskRabbit, I mean, think about the conversation that's happening in business and politics and society is this income gap, right? Um, the haves and the haves nots. And what our platform does is allows people the opportunity to close that and provide something meaningful in terms of income. But the tech, we have a responsibility to answer the question. And we created the question of rapid pace of change and how technology is transforming and there's AI and automation, all these jobs are gonna go away, mm -hmm. then how do we actually answer that question? So I spend my days thinking, about, okay, we're answering that question right now with just a little bit, but we're not the solution to the overall problem, which is that there will be continued displacement and what is our responsibility for addressing that displacement? Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to take businesses and government to work together to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say that I think when you talk about uh, representation and who we need in positions of leadership, I just love that you are in your position of leadership and coming from the experience of having been in Detroit and seeing what happened with automation and how that affected real people and real communities and how important I know that will be to the, I know that the this, this decision is not only yours to make, so no pressure, but um, you know, to have you at that table is just so important. So um, can we give our guests a round of applause? Thank you both. So I think we have time for um, like t five, no? No? Oh, okay, maybe one question, five? Okay, <laughs> five minutes. So do we have any um, questions in the audience? Oh, you right. Good morning and thank you both. I really appreciate everything you had to say. First, I have a comment for you, Stacy. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, her comment, or actually it was a quote that she made a long time ago. Um, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, or a ride on a rocket ship, you don't ask for the seat, you just get on. I, that motivated me from that point. For you, sir, um, thank you for everything you've done. I followed you ever since I was a financial advisor coming from a little wiring house up through Merrill Lynch. My question to you is, how did you not lose yourself conforming? Because that's the issue that I face, because pretty much I'm going to be myself. But I find myself at times kind of teetering the line between conforming and not. Yeah, I, I think the real issue for me was I thought my execution in the job, the role that I had, was pretty good. But I could see others around me who I perceived to have a step ahead of me in the process, that they were likely to get a management job before I would get a management job. And I wanted to make sure that the reason that was gonna occur didn't have something to do with something that was silly, hence a blue suit and a white shirt. Um, once I got through that, then the question became, okay, how well do I conform to the broader social ecosystem of IBM? And here's a classic example. I was an avid, avid, avid tennis player. Well, people at IBM didn't play much tennis. They played golf. 
I'm like, oh shit, I gotta learn to play golf. <laughs> and and there's there's something about becoming a part of the broader community, not just candidly the African American community of the company, but the broader community. Because once you're a part of that broader community, you gain insights that you wouldn't get from a more narrow perspective, if you will. And so coming to the realization, my gosh, I'm not doing things right, acknowledging that you're not doing things right, is in fact the first step to transform you to become more compliant, more involved, more engaged, and you know, it worked out okay for me, I guess. <laughs> Any other questions? I sound good on this mic. Let me come over here. <laughs> we switching mics, Mina. Boy, this is my mic. Until you give me the mic. <laughs> hey, John, I got, I got to tell you, I have followed you since, uh, when, since you joined Symantec. Actually, I joined Symantec because of you. <laughs> and so, you know, I flew up here uh, for meetings uh, at corporate headquarters and canceled all of my meetings because I wanted to hear you talk. So, so again, my question is, <laughs> like you, uh, I am the first person of color in semantic to be distinguished. I think you know what that is. <laughs> and so I love mentoring and giving back, but success without passing it back to others is a failure. So how would you recommend that I bring up others, and I'm not going to say people of color, because right now I am an example, but I do want to uh, see these individuals uh, advance. So if you can share that, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a very important distinction between mentoring and giving advice. And I'm in the world of I give advice all the time. Uh, and it's worth exactly what you paid for it, quite frankly. Uh, but I don't mentor many people because I think mentoring is about a personal relationship between you and the person on the other side. And in my particular case, I had many mentors throughout my career, none of which looked like me, quite frankly. And so I think what we have to think about in this room is, first off, mentoring is not about advice. Mentoring is about a personal relationship that leads to a level of confidence and trust between two people that allows the advice to be adhered to and acknowledged and executed. Because if you don't do that, then what? And so think about it in the context of you're better off to have two mentors or two people that you mentor than 200. And if I were to go to my LinkedIn page right now, I'd be willing to bet I'd have five requests at a minimum to be someone's mentor, people I don't even know. And I think we have to open the aperture a little bit to, I'm willing to give you advice, but let's not call it mentoring, because mentoring is much, much deeper than that, and it creates a much, much better level of insight and understanding for the person or people that you're mentoring. Excellent, and that's six LinkedIn requests. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> okay, that's going to conclude our panel. Thank you very much, John, Mina, Stacy. Excellent. <laughs>